This is Selma Schimmel for the group room at the 14th World Conference on Lung Cancer, WCLC, organized by the IASLC, the International Association for the Study of Lung Cancer. We are in Amsterdam. And now I'm joined by Dr. Professor Tony Mock from the Department of Clinical Oncology, the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Hello, Dr. Mock. Hello. Thank you for the invitation. Oh, I'm so pleased you're here because you are president-elect of the IASLC. Well, looking forward to work together with the current presidents and hopefully we can do something positive. Well, I would imagine that this is a very important collaborative time for you as you work in sync with the current president, who is uh, Dr. Peter Goldstraw. Goldstraw, as a way for you to begin to focus on your vision when you... Well, that's the importance about the uh, ISLC, the I stands for the international. So we had always been internationally collaborative with both the, I mean, the president elect or the president, past president, and the president current. They are all from three different continents, United States, Europe, and then the rest of the world. There's a specific area I'd like to discuss with you, and that is uh, lung cancer in the, in the Asian population. Mm -hmm. We have learned it's a very distinct disease for these patients. Well, there's two points. Uh, one is that we do have a very uh, unique disease uh, entity in a sense is that we have a much higher incidence of a non-smoker lung cancer, especially about, uh, in the uh, female population. And this population has been more specific tied to the you know, well-known EGFR mutation and more recently the ERM4L uh, transgenic mutation. So in a sense is that we had a population with a high incidence of this mutation where we can have a very effective therapy for, so we have a big task to select them. So that's one area. The second area is the fact that there has been a good effort in the tobacco control in the Western country. But on the contrast, in places like China, and other Asian country, tobacco control is still got a long way to go. And there is increasing number of smoker and also there's a rising number of lung cancer patients. So this is another area we need to do a lot of work on. You mentioned women mm -hmm. and I'd like you to expand a little bit. We have learned more and more amongst the general population of women that there are real um, gender, biologic issues, perhaps, you know, even hormonal mm -hmm. implications in regard to women and lung cancer. In the Asian population, it's even more complicated than what we already know in other female populations. Well, this, um, we can look into, into two different directions. Uh, one is the environmental, the other one is genetic. First, about the environmental is the fact that um, in Asia, in the older days, it's a woman do not smoke as much. The incidence of smoker among the female population is much lower than the Western population way back a number of years ago. Now it's changing, unfortunately, which is bad. So that's one is that we got less uh, so-called smoker uh, in terms of the female population. Secondarily, in the environment exposure, there have been a lot of different speculation, including uh, cooking oil, which actually, you know, there are high exposure of that in the way of cooking in the Asian population, and also, uh, especially in China, the use of so-called dirty coal, you know, in cooking and warming in the house, which also increase the risk of lung cancer. So that is one area. And then the other area is the genetic susceptibility. Now, this is area still require a lot of research, but now there are start to surface, there are certain susceptible genes that may be a little bit more prevalent in the Asian population, but that is not been well defined as yet. In the female population of non-smokers, what is the age that you're seeing uh, the development of lung cancer? Especially uh, on the mutation positive uh, Asian female, we tend to see them in the younger, in younger age. Commonly, it's, they may start into the 40s and all the way into the 70s, 80s, but the median is into the 50s, which is the younger than the median lung cancer age in the male population coming closer to 60. And from the time of becoming symptomatic to when these patients are actually diagnosed, what is that period? Now, it is hard to get that statistic in a sense that we do not know how long they have had it. And then, you know, but then you've talked about from the symptom until the diagnosis, usually it can be quite quick. You know, in a sense is that by the time you got symptom, the cancer is probably quite significant or in a later stage because the lung is a big organ. Uh, if they got small early stage disease, the patient may become asymptomatic. 
and then by the time they got symptomatic, that you should advance stage. Now that led to one very important area that is about screening. We just learned some new information that we should screen the smoker from the uh, National uh, Cancer Institute study that demonstrating that CD scan screening may reduce mortality in the smoker. But what about the never smoker? Should we screen that? There's no data on it. So maybe in the future, this is one other area we have to work on in Asia. Understanding some of the unique biologic components of lung cancer in the Asian population, how does that correlate with treatment and treatment design? Well, because of the high incidence of each mutation, particularly in the non-smoker population, uh, we have been actually um, uh, so-called the uh, encouraging the uh, mutation testing uh, very early on because by identifying the patient with the EGFR mutation and now recently the M4 mutation, we, do, we, may, we will have a specific drug targeting them and that certainly changed the outlook of the patient tremendously. Uh, previously, as a lung cancer doctor, I you know, the survival of the patient is limited, we don't get chemotherapy, but now with the knowing of the genetic molecular marker and the effective treatment, I got patient live for many years. What about culture? What role does culture play in the perception of cancer? Oh, that is a complex question. I mean, in a way is that Asia is a very heterogeneous society and is really variable from one to the other. Uh, but certainly the stigma of cancer still stay, you know, in a sense is that a lot of patients maybe try to hide information or actually the family will try to hide the information from the parent. That still exists. So now that we... That feeling of being, um, quote, damaged. Damaged it or uh, stigmatized it. And so w we, we also are probably a little bit lacking behind in terms of psychosocial support for the ca cancer patient, particularly lung cancer patient in the so-called the uh, Asian society. And in, in that way, that we have still a lot to learn from the Western society, which do encourage the positive support of the psychosocial aspect for cancer patient. What is the integrative approach of cancer therapy in China, where there's a reverence for Eastern approaches to medicine, as well as the integration of Western medicine? How do these two meet? I still remember the interview that you have with me to, uh, a number of years ago on Chinese medicine. Um, over all this year, I don't think it changed that much. In a sense is that it exists. There's a lot of so-called uh, patients still utilize the uh, uh, Chinese medicine or traditional approach. And, but at the same time, they also engage in the Western treatment. So when you say combine, meaning that coexistent or combine in a sense that you know that it's going to be better. Unfortunately, to the current day of science, that all we can understand is that, yes, they may happen concurrently, the patient may feel good, but there's no data to say that it's going to make things better. Do you have to deal with trust issues on behalf of Western medicine approaches sometimes with patients? Uh, trust in a sense of? I would rather take one of, uh, a Chinese medicine approach. I don't know if I trust this Western medicine. Right. Um, actually, it's not so much of a trust issue. It's a matter of a choice of the um, therapy and its toxicity. A lot of the patients may avoid chemotherapy or Western medicine because of their concern about toxicity. While traditionally, the Chinese medicine is less toxic, was milder, and it become more preferable. So to me, I, I don't believe that they don't trust you. It's just that, uh, yes, you can do so much, but I don't like toxicity. The elderly population who maybe lives in more remote areas, let's say, will they readily come to a major teaching hospital or will they try alternative therapies on their own first? Now, unfortunately, I come from Hong Kong. I don't have too much of a rural area in Hong Kong. Right. But then if you talk about the rural area in China, the fact of the matter is that a lot of them, we never even know about their existence because they never get a chance or even financial status to come to a major city makes me feel sad. It is, but then the fact of the matter is um, in a lot of those rural areas, um, they don't get education, they don't get basic care, they may not even have a warm bed. Right, and so maybe the, you've just answered some of my question about some of the social implications that are the challenges that you face differently than perhaps well, someone the, in... The, this, uh, there's two differences. Num number one is the disparity of uh, wealth uh, in Asian country is still wider than 
the you know, significant middle class, uh, you know, that's more proliferative, you know, in the Western country. That's one. And also the healthcare system. The healthcare system is partly nationalized. I don't know what's happening in the United States or what will happen in the United States. But, you know, in China, it's still difficult is that, you know, uh, a lot of the patients still have to scram for money to be able to obtain good health care. Thank you for sharing that little bit of, of, of cultural insight with us. I look forward to meeting with you again when you assume your leadership here at IASLC. And that will be two years from now. Hopefully we'll meet sooner than that. And where will the meeting be in two years? Uh, Sydney. The IASLC is an incredibly important organization in unifying the multidisciplinary team mm -hmm. that treats lung cancer. What can we do to encourage membership, if you wouldn't mind talking a bit about why membership is important? Right. Well, first of all, we have to say, what does the ISLC do? Uh, you know, this is an international organization. People may perceive us as you know, just organizing the World Lung Cancer Congress, but this is only a small part of our job. Uh, we have, number one, uh, education. In that term, that we have to be involved with the major publication journal, the Journal of Forest Oncology. And we have been into education in terms of multiple different conferences throughout the year. And also, we support other conferences on lung cancer in different countries. So all these are very important. And then in terms of the uh, training for the next generation, we have fellowship program that we actually support, not just from major country, but also from emerging country to have further training in the so-called advances in lung cancer. And now we're also moving on into a number of the education of public for our communication event. So there's a variety of events that we, we try to engage so that we try to change so-called the management of lung cancer. And hopefully our mission statement is to minimize the death related to it. And as a member, we will be able to engage into this process. And as a member, you are part of this whole, the family. Dr. Professor Tony Ma from the Department of Clinical Oncology at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Thank you, Professor Ma. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you.